Hi, Seth. How are you? I'm well, Dr. Glenn. How have you been? Okay. You know. <laughs> yeah. How's your family? Uh, adjust my PC because I spoke together last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, was it over in class at the, on Monday? I was actually leaving the micro center because that's when I wanted to go buy my PC parts. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they have yep. some good deals at Micro Center. I like oh, Micro yeah. Center. <laughs> and their um, salespeople are really helpful. Yeah, but the line is so long. <laughs> the line uh, is crazy. Hi, and I went, there were people outside camping in tents waiting for Micro Center to get shipments and hoping to get video cards. Yeah, I think it's, that's hot right now. Hey, Patrick. How are you doing? <laughs> How was your rest? Oh, it's on mute. I think you it put you on mute, but yeah, there you go. I can't hear you. I think maybe it's um, your microphone. But anyway, so Micro Center is great. I like going there, but it's just so busy. So, yeah. I still can't hear you, Patrick. I think it's just uh, probably have to turn on the settings on your computer. So funny story. I went to go, um, I was waiting for an associate to help me get my processor. I was getting the Ryzen 5 uh -huh. and then there was a gentleman next to me. I said, hey, bro, do you know anything about the BIOS update for uh, the 5000 series? Because I bought a 5900X. I was like, I just kind of look at him and it's almost shook. It's like, uh. <laughs> well, so are, uh, you, are, yeah. are you upgrading or are you building another one? I built another one. Oh, that's nice. Right? Uh, I got a Ryzen 5 this time. I had a second gen i5. That's what I'm upgrading from. Yeah. I mean, that's a while ago, so Ryzen 5 would be really nice for you. Did you what kind of board did you buy? I got the a B550 board. Oh, okay. And it has wireless built in? Yes. Awesome. Very nice. That's the way to go. <laughs> yeah. And how much RAM did you get? 32? 32. Yeah, they're get, super affordable now. Right? I got the T16 case in case I want to go to 64. Oh, okay, that's good. Did you get? Did you also get SSD? I got an M.2 drive. I was gonna get yeah. the Fire Cuda, and then the cell associates was really helpful. Says we have a better deal for you for a dollar more. You can get a 980 Evil Pro, and it has seven gigs write speed. Oh, wow. all right. Or is it read speed? No, it's the read speed. Write slower. So, it what video card did you get? I'm still using my 1080 Ti. They didn't have video cards for sale. That's that's still pretty good. Yeah, they're short right now. From what I know, is even processor and, and boards are short because um, I talked to my uh, family member. He does some stuff in engineering for mechanical, and he mentioned that like you know when he orders stuff from china or wherever even in united states everybody wanted like a million dollars up front for all business order because they wanted to make sure that you know you put the money in before they go into production because they're short they're short everywhere so it it drives up a lot of the prices like like the the micro bit that we're trying to get nobody has them as soon as they come out they are, they're sold they're completely sold so because have you heard about you like shuffle no. It's this program they have where you go in and when they have video cards available, they do basically a raffle and then they email you and you have a two hour oh. window on a card or not. Oh, well, maybe that you can get a good deal through there. But I, I did get a video card a while back and this was like a few months ago and they it dropped in price so i picked up one and then now it's gone back in price again so well you know hot commodity computer parts these days <laughs> it's honestly it's the it's the my wait do you remember the prices of skyrocketing and like the stocks were down when mining was a was a thing mm -hmm. 
Now it's like a second wave of the mining boom. And now we have scalpers. They moved into video cards. Yeah. So because people want it so bad and most people are working from home. So, you know, that's... If you ever get a chuckle, look at Craigslist and look at the price that they're asking for video cards. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. Thanks for letting me know. And we're just talking about video cards, how hot commodity they can be. Um, but now we're gonna get into gear and we're gonna do Python scapey, yay. So I was rewriting the lab yesterday and I try to get something where everybody can achieve um, and not too crazy difficult, right? And this is kind of fun. Um, so I did fire up my Ubuntu virtual machine, um, but I wanna touch base with you on um, what you need to do as far as the type of OS that you're using. So if you have virtual machine, you can use it. Um, if you have Mac OS, Mac OS, if you didn't install Python 3, you need to install Python 3. It'll work better with Python 3. Um, and then for Windows, the instruction for Windows in the documentation is not very good. So what I'll do is I'll drop a link for you. Um, one second, let me stop share because it hides my tabs. That's one thing I don't like about Zoom app is that it just takes over the interface. Okay, so what you can do is you can visit this site and it's actually, um, uh, is a better instruction set and I'll link it on your lab in case you didn't get the chat link. But so you can directly use Windows. Um, I test drive it with Windows, it's okay. Um, so if you wanted to run it straight on your regular computer, you can, you don't have to run the virtual machine, but if you have a virtual machine, you can use it and practice on Linux. Um, because a lot of these tools that you see is written in Python and it's really geared for Linux systems um, or Unix systems. So, but on this particular library, it has like a, it, it's a compressed file that it uses setup.py. Um, so it's a little tedious to install. Um, and I tried, you know, putting stuff together with the Linux. So let me go back into screen share here. So what I did was I wrote the instruction for Ubuntu. Um, you can follow the instruction if you're using Ubuntu, but if you use another flavor of um, Linux, you just gotta change up the commands um, for that flavor. And you should install TCP dump with it. So that way you can scale out on uh, Scapy because Scapy is useful when you start making uh, security tools and network tools, and it can be very fun. Um, now on the Windows side, you need to install Nmap because Scapy is often used for network monitoring. So, and um, Nmap is a package that's required and you probably have installed it in the past if you installed GSN3. Um, it's used for capturing network traffic. Um, so if you use Wireshark, if you use any network monitoring tool on your system, you likely probably have NCAP already installed. So um, which is what happened to me, I already installed it previously for GSN3 and uh, VMware and, um, and they are uh, Wireshark. And so I, I actually had that, but my instruction is written in. So the first part of this is basically uh, with the Linux systems, right? But let me touch on the Windows. So if you click on the link that's provided, um, you would need to kind of go through it. So here it talks about if you're running a Mac OS or you, you're using a Mac, um, you, it's equipped with Python 2 if you didn't install Python 3. And um, so you can install Python 3, but for the Windows system, you can go and look at your Python version to start. But to install Scapy, this is what you do. 
Okay, so you can do a pip3, and if you don't have pip install, it will give you an error or a message, and then you just follow the instruction to install pip. So if you took my CIS 30A class last semester, or even in the winter, I touch on how to do TK enter um, and using pip to do the install. So you just do install scapy like this. Since I already had it installed, it showed me where that is. And you notice that the path it's linked to my Python. And that's what you want because if you if if you don't have Python installed, you need to install Python before um, you install Scapy. And if you didn't have Scapy installed, it's going to give you these status bars, and then it's going to go through and it'll tell you whether it's successful or not. Usually, if it, it install, it's going to say successfully install. So that's what you do. And now, if you wanted to run it with Python then you can do a Python 3 like this. And then that's gonna take you to Python. And then you can look at the Scapy version. So here, what they're saying at the beginning is that you can open it in Python, okay? And then you can run it in the Python shell. Um, that means that you just simply do an import Right, and you can do from scapy import asterisk, and or because if you use import scapy asterisk, it's not going to bring in everything. Um, now, if you wanted to run scapy, it has its own shell. So let me do an exit. So you can just issue the exit function to get out of Python. And you can do the, the virtual environment with Python if you want. So now- um, Professor, this is on Windows and not on the, not on the Linux? The you can do it any in any OS, but you have to get it installed. I wrote the instruction for Ubuntu, but I wanna show you how you can use it on Windows as well. Okay. Now, I, did, I, I was able to import it in Windows. Yeah. So if you if you read their documentation, they show you how you can import it in Windows. But I'm just illustrating real quick because some of you might not have access to virtual machine. Um, I've seen some of your lab coming in. I know that most of you have done virtual machine, um, but in the case that you don't, you can run it on Mac OS or Windows or Linux. Okay. So I've been um, trying. To, I've been trying to do it on the on on the Ubuntu, but it's giving me a missing destination file all brand get all. Hmm. I was able to install it on Ubuntu 20. Yeah. So if you so make sure that number a few things that you need is did you if you follow my instructions, right? Um, you have to do a get all install first, Chris. And because if you don't have Git, you're not able to pull it from GitHub. Okay, so the message that it's giving you okay. is that you didn't have Git all. And you, if you're trying to do Git clone, it's not gonna understand. So what you need to do is you need to do a sudo install Git all. That's, this is on Ubuntu, okay? <clears throat> and then once you have that, then you would do a Git clone and you point it to the website. So in any case, if you need to get any packages from Git, if you have Git all, then you can point to the GitHub where that package is being released. Okay. Um, let me move my chat thing over here. I, f I figure out why I couldn't get it. I, I you have to put sudo app install. Yes. So if you do, if you, if you, yeah, you can do sudo app like this. Okay. And then you can, you can also, when I did it, I just did sudo install get all and it, it actually worked, but I might've missed a step or something like that when I wrote it down, because I have to test it and then write down the instruction for you guys. But, um, and then yeah, so if you do sudo app install or sudo app get install, sometimes that works on the Debian side. 
um, and then you can once you have gotten the git clone then what you can do is you can do a cd and michelle put in the chat that she's able to do it from the graphical user interface and that's fine too okay and then on the linux side you have to do sudo that super user do python 3 and then set up py install but you should get um you should get tcp dump with it okay someone is at the bellflower front door and you can install you can install a lot other packages so if you look at their documentation okay you would see that you know they have some illustration on how to use these tools there's also a quick demo that they have it on loop so you can take a look at how to use it um, and it gives you a lot of the information about probe now if you want to venture out and use scapey you can look at build your own tools and here it shows you on how you can use the library right like write a full python file and run it so like on this one we would do an arp ping and arp allows us to look at the mac table um, so you can ping to the mac address instead of pinging to an ip address so now you know from an attacker standpoint they can check out what connection or what system is being connected to a certain segment. And then, you know, if they want to issue the attack, they can spoof a certain Mac um, and use the Mac address to impersonate a system that's on your network. Um, and then from the administration side, we would use it to manage and administer our systems, looking at how our systems are connected. So here, this shows you on how you can do our ping. So you can definitely define functions and write it as a regular Python file, okay? Um, and it shows you various tools. So it's pretty cool. It has like different things that you can, you can use um, even on some of the, you know, the Bluetooth side, because when you work with network devices, you have you have different protocols that are at work. Um, and then if you wanted to take a look at the HTTP, it shows you on how. Now, if you want the interface like this, um, they have some options where you can do like 3D graphs when you're doing analysis. Um, you can even map, right, connections um, if you install the map packages. So it gives you the interface very much like what you've seen in some of the network monitoring tool that you have. So you can definitely incorporate um, network interface. So on the documentation, if you look at usage, I took some of the exercise from here and added it. Um, but here it walks you through every single step on how to use it, okay? And then if you want like the graphical dumps, this uses the PDF. So it, you have to install the package for PDF. Um, I tried to get all of this set up yesterday, but the issue is that once you install a package, it wants another package and then it just like going down that rabbit hole, right? Um, but if you have time, you can definitely set up packages and then be able to use them for Scapy, okay? Now for the download and the installation on the documentation, it shows you, you know, it walks you through. So if you're using other versions of Linux, you can check this out as well. And, you know, um, there's a link in your notes for this. Okay. And then if you're using pip, so one of the library that's very helpful is to use matplotlib and it use conda. So um, with matplotlib, you have to, you should install Conda with it. And I know Michelle's familiar with it, right? Um, and it, this, these libraries are often used in like analysis. So when we do net, when we use network monitoring tool, we want to analyze it. So it gives you some options on how you can plot it. 
Um, and then here it talks about how you can do PDF dump, like what you see with the graphic earlier. And you need to have Pi X and Pi X uses 2.7 Python, not 3. Point. I couldn't find the package for Python 3, but if you use Python 2.7, you can use Pi X. Um, and it's distributed by LaTeX. I know that some of you might be familiar with LaTeX if you've taken math courses before. Um, some math faculty uses LaTeX, but here it, it walks you through on how you can use PDF dump and then put it into a, a PDF file. So that's kind of cool. Um, and so much more, right? And so if you click on the usage on the documentation, it walks you through the, the actual setup. Okay. And then if you use Fedora, so I install TCP dump. Um, and if on the Fedora, you just use yum instead of the sudo app get. So the commands are slightly different. And then on the Mac OS side, um, you can do the brew. And the brew, you need to just, it walks you through on how you can install the PCAP. That's equivalent to the NCAP on the Windows side. Okay. And then you have to install the Mac port. So there's additional things that's required for different OS because, but it does work across. Okay. So the steps that's given to you in the, here is, I wrote it for the Linux Ubuntu virtual machine. Um, but like I said, you can definitely use Windows virtual machine. I mean, Windows, not Windows virtual machine or Mac OS. It just, it takes, you know, there are different steps that's going to be involved. So it's flexible. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can change the theme. So it has like color choices like Rasta, um, or if you want bright color, you can do bright color, but the generic, or you can do black and white. So you can just simply use the method for the theme. And since it's incorporated in the library, it would give you the change of the look and feel, okay? So once you install Scapy on any OS, you can simply run it by calling it, right? When you say Scapy, you issue that command and it's gonna take you to its shell, okay? So it's gonna look like this. Now, if you wanted to configure the color and the look of it, so this is the default look. And if you wanted to do that, you can issue that here. So unlike your regular Python file, you don't, you know, you don't require, you're not required to write the complete file. So for every line, we, it's gonna be interpreting, right? Um, so you use the shell directly. So with that, what we can do is we can do a send, right, IP. And what we're doing here is we're using a send method. And in the notes, we talked about how we can use send and receive, which is the SR, or we can use the send. And there's other options in how you want to send. So basically you're saying that you're sending an IP and the destination, you just gotta put it in the quotation mark and the protocol that you're using is gonna be following that. That will be your ping. So ICMP, what it's gonna do is it's gonna send the request. And when you do this, you should get only one packet that's gonna come back, okay? So let me log on to my Ubuntu now so you can also see. Sorry, it's a little slow now that I put a bunch of stuff on it. And plus... Um, do you have to do a sudo for any of the commands in Scappy? Once, so once you are in Scappy as a super user do, you don't, okay? So in the, once you use sudo scapy, then you would, you, once you get in it with, as a super user, you can use it as that, right? It, if you don't, if you just use scapy, 
it's not going to let you do some of the tasks that's going to be requiring higher privilege. It's going to tell you there's no permission. Okay, so yeah, at the beginning, you just have to do pseudoscapy. Okay, and then, so let me see. Okay, so to open terminal, So we just do sudo scapey after the install, and then it's gonna prompt you with the password. Once you authenticate, it's gonna open that up, right? And mine takes a little longer because now like I didn't increase the RAM on this one. So it's just a little slow. So it's gonna say that it can't import PyX because I put it on, I use three on this. And so, um, oh, sorry. But now here is where you would start. So when we do a ping, we can do a send Oops. IP. And then in the parameter, you just simply pass your, your destination, okay? So DST equals and then put it in quotation mark. And now after you put in the, the IP address, then you would put in the actual protocol. And on this one, I forgot ICMP has. Okay, so you should get like a one packet that's being sent. So that way you can test it um, by just using this. And what it does is it use the library, right? And so we're actually, we're using the library. And so this method is already, is a built in with that library. And then now it also knows your protocol and so what it does is it's going to send the request. Um, now in the demo, if you look at the demo, they also show how you can use the dot show. Um, dot show also can be incorporated so that way you can see your packets. So the way I wrote this is that I wanted you to be able to craft your packet. Um, and with the packet, what we can do is we can change the time to live because that's just a field that's in the packet. And by default, it would give you 64. Um, if you ever run Wireshark or network monitoring tool and you double click the packet, you can look at the packet body and the header and the information. So what we're doing in this in this stage here on step 10, right, um, is that we are declaring A and for the A, it's gonna contain the field for that packet that's we, and we, de we define it as, or we assign the value 10. So when it sends the request or receive the reply, all packets have a time to live. TTL stands for time to live. And so that way it would expire out if it doesn't, you know, if it's if, in this, in this uh, parameter, okay? So what we're doing is we are taking it and we're reducing it down to 10 instead of 64 by default. And then what we do is we also need to specify the source address and you can put in any source that you want to send from. Okay, and also the destination. So when you do this, it's going to say, oh, it is itself. That's the machine that you're using. And then you can specify the destination. Who do you want to send that packet to? Okay. So after you specify the, the you look at the source address then you can assign, right? Basically we declare a destination address, okay? And, and then after that, what we're doing here <clears throat> is 
on step 15, we are using the 10 as a value for time to live, okay? But I'm sorry, we are deleting the time to live and then we're using the 10 values. So what we did was we have to edit the time to live in that packet. So from an attacker standpoint, if, you, if they can actually crack the packet before they send that packet and, and, and they can choose the target by setting the destination, okay? So here, what we did was we removed the value that was in time to live by the default value. And then we put in the 10 for the time to live, okay? And then that way we would, then we would take a look at whether it register or not by using the IP underscore. So after that, what you can do is you can then send that packet. Right, you can issue that packet by doing the send, or you can do a send and receive by doing SR. Okay, so now the fun part in this is to be able to modify it, and you can simply use Python to do that. Right, um, where you know, yes, it can do a lot of things. Like you know, if if we can send packets and receive packets, that's good, but you have to look at the security side on how these tools can be useful. What if you wanted to modify the packet to really pen test your network? What if you wanted to modify something in the packet to see you know, the boundary of your system? So at this point, what we're gonna do here is we would, we would use HTTP. And for HTTP, there are um, very similar to ICMP, but it does the get and reply. Okay, so in order to actually, so when when a person open up their browser and and put in a website, a URL, okay, what happens in the back is that HTTP belongs under TCP suite, so it's gonna go and it's gonna get right. It's gonna pull information for that web page and in traffic we would see that that happening right that packet is being sent so when you do this what you're doing is you're using this interface and your destination is now www.slash.org but all all hosted website comes back to an IP address, okay? So it's gonna tie this to, and the DNS job, that's what it, it's doing, right? It's gonna convert your URL to an IP address for that domain. So when you do this, what you're doing is you are connecting to this particular website and you're issuing the, and you're accessing the index.html, which is normally on most um, web server that file exists for that particular web page. And you're doing a get with HTTP. So when a user visit a website, when you're monitoring the traffic, you see this, you see that it's gonna show get, right, HTTP. Any HTTP traffic, it's gonna show that. And normally the initial, step is to really acquire the index, which is going to help load, you know, the, the actual page content, um, not the page itself, but just the index for that particular page. Okay. And then after that, you would do a hex dump. What this will do is it's going to look at the packet and it's going to give you um, the hex detail. Okay, hexadecimal value, okay? So it's gonna say like X zero, blah, 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 right? So, and that pertains to the hex value that would be referencing the packet and how it's stored. Sorry about my dog, okay? And then you would then look at the raw information for that packet. So it looks slightly different 
because on Wireshark and Network Monitoring Tool Interface, everything is presented to you in a more organized manner. So what you're doing is you're looking at the packet from a different view. And a lot of times what you see is you're gonna see, you know, the ether information, the entire, you know, so pieces of this, this is what we're doing is we're looking at the packet from different pieces because when they write these application for network monitoring, they put all of these pieces together and it, they simply just call the method, okay? So you will see it in the raw form. You will also see it from the interface form, okay? And then, so after, when you look at the HTTP, you should look at the TTL value, the time to live value, and you would see it would say like 64. Okay, that is the default value, but when we crafted it earlier for a different packet, right, we had modified it. So you can definitely modify some of the field in the packet and make it do what you want it to do. Okay, so that is what it's showing here and here. Okay, question? question. Oh, for the um, IP address 192.168, were we supposed to change that to a valid one or just leave it yeah, as Yeah, you can, you can, I mean, if you really want to execute it for a destination so you can see the result, right, you can put in a, a valid address of your choice. I'm fine with that. Um, I only put that because I figured that when you're on your home network, it might be in this range. But if you put in an invalid IP, it's still going to take it. It's just not going to be reachable. Okay. So when you, so this is arbitrary address, like you can craft the, the packet for any destination. So in this case, you would plug in whoever that you wanted to send that to. Okay. And if you use something that doesn't work, you can, you can always go back and modify it later by just reassigning it. Okay, so you guys can choose on which address you want to use. Other questions? Yeah, I was getting no uh, root, no root found. Yeah, uh, because if you use this, it's gonna say that, right? Um, if you if you use one twenty seven dot zero dot zero dot one, it is uh, you sending it to itself, then you might get some valid. So if you don't have another system to test, you can test it, you can loop it. Okay, so you can use a loopback address. Okay, so this is optional to the IP that's given here, but if you wanted to use the actual IP for your system, you can, you can just send that packet. All that does is just a packet, right? And we just shorten the time to live on it. That's all it's doing. It's nothing crazy. Okay, so it won't corrupt your system or anything like that. Um, okay. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to incorporate on this is to show you how you can filter through Python is if you use the high default method what that does is it's going to delete the field that has the same information. So that way it doesn't really give you a lot of stuff, right? Um, stuff that is repetitive. So when you do the high defaults, what that does is it's going to delete the field that has the same value as the default in the packet and it's going to shorten it. So when you look at the packet from the previous step, going into how you would hide the default, it's gonna look different, okay? So what that does is, you know, it transition you from looking at things that would be in raw form to something that would be readable to the human where it puts in all the field and then you can start hiding some of the default information. Okay. Now, 
instead of using an IP address, you, you see here, you can definitely put in an actual site, right? Like this one, okay? So you don't, you're not tied to an IP address because when you put the IP in the front right here, it's, the, it's gonna convert it to the IP because all traffic goes to an IP address. The, the, the URL is just for human, okay? Because we read text and the computer reads numbers. So, so at the end of the day, if you put in a URL instead of a, a, an IP address, it's still gonna go. If it's a valid URL, it's gonna go, okay? Any question with this? So this is a little bit different than what you normally see in like, you know, Python programming because we are now just working with the networks. And when you use this, you're actually using like internet traffic. Okay. So here, what you can do is you can generate a number of packets and you can send it, right? So how do they flood, right? They can flood with ICMP traffic, like ping of death, right? The book talks about that, where they can ping continuously so many times. And all that is just modifying, right? Your instructions for the system and you can use library like this. Or in the case of HTTP, like this one, Right. Um, for web server, web server, its job is to what to serve the pages to the, the 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 systems that connect into it. Right. That's requesting it. So when you visit a website, you request that service. <clears throat> and on the web server side, how can they take down the web server? They can continue to request it nonstop rapidly. And they can do it with bots or they can do it, you know, usually from a single system, it's just going to be very tedious and, and strenuous on your system. But um, so if you have continuous requests to that, it's not, it, it's going to bog down that server and eventually that server will slow down and that becomes, you know, either distributed denial of service or denial of service in general. So from the programming side, we can see this. Um, and so in a way that you can test your system is you can, you can check it this way. You can test your web server. You can, you can test your database server. You know, all of them are connected together and we can use library like this, okay? Okay, so here it shows you on how you can generate packets, okay? And then after you, declare this, you have to, you want to show it, you just simply call the variable or the object. You just use the, you use that object in, in the shell and it would show you, okay? Then you can also create a list of packets and we can loop using for and the membership operator. So once you declare A, you can say P for P in A, and then, you know, and then you can declare B, and then you can say P for P in B, and you can simply put it in a list like this. So what you can do is you can generate a list of packets, right, for that destination. And then basically that's just a container then you can make another container that holds the field that you want for those packets, like time to live, and you can specify them. So we can do it all in one shot instead of doing individually with crafting one packet at a time. We can do it as a group, okay? So what this shows you right here is you're, you're actually modifying the time to live for the packets that was in list in, in the A, okay? And then you can even specify the type of ports like HTTP or HTTPS, which is port 80 or port 443. 
So for the C, what you did, what you're doing here is you actually specifying the ports for these packets. And we use port number here. So port 80 is for HTTP and 443. Sometimes 444 is used for HTTPS, but the common port that's used in most cases that will be 443. Okay. Then we would then generate the list. And at this point, after you do that, it should register these ports as your DC port. It would say HTTP or HTTPS in that group. Okay. Now, like earlier, you have seen how send is used. So we can send it to a destination and here we can have it loop or you can send it to the URL like what you've seen. But if you do the return packets is true, it's gonna give you the return information. It's gonna return the information for that packet. Okay, but make sure we use capital T for true, otherwise it's gonna throw an error because that's a bool value. Okay. So basically this is a toggle, right? So um, any questions so far? And you might hear about fuzz, right? Um, Sometimes this is being discussed in, you know, pen test classes and also Python programming classes for security. But fuzz is used. And so here I added some information about fuzz. So the function fuzz is able to change any default value that is not calculated like checksum by an object for whose value in random and whose type is adapted to that field. So this enabled the quick building fuzz templates by sending them in a loop, okay? So in, in you know, if, if you use Kali Linux before, you might've seen, you know, tool that use fuzz, okay? I know that Aircrack use fuzz, um, so <clears throat> here in this example, what we're doing is when you, the IP layer is normal and the UDP for the NTP layer is fast. So you can definitely change, right? Modify some field for a specific protocol. Okay, so that's what fuzz is used for. So for the user datagram here, what we're doing is we're doing a checksum so UDP checksum will be correct. UDP destination port will be overloaded by NTP to be 123 and NTP version will be forced to be four, okay? And so if you use FUS in the IP layer, your source and destination parameter won't be random. So it will be, and so you have to use RAN IP. And this is a built-in function. So the fuzz function that's built into the library, right? Um, it's better to use it if you wanted to modify like checksum, you would use it with datagram, user datagram protocol or NTP. So in this example, in this exercise, this step, right? I put in target here, but you can just put in if you want to put in a certain IP, you can. Like you can do a loopback IP. So I would do a loopback IP because if you yeah. do target, it's not going to know what target is. Okay. Yeah, I got errors, OS yeah. errors in target. Right. So you need to put in, so here, this one, you need to put in a target IP and I would do a loopback IP, especially when we you use 
tools like this, you should test it on your own system and not other people's system because that creates legal issues. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So here you simply pass UDP and NTP, and then you can specify the version and the, the number for loop. <clears throat> this might take a little bit. Okay. If it doesn't throw any air, it's going to take a little bit. I tested it with my loopback um, my loopback address yesterday, and it, it, it was fine. OK, so it should list the packets that were sent if it reached the destination. So if your target is a valid target, like your own system, then it should tell you how many that was sent and how many received. So in, in the step 31, basically you're using fuzz, right? To make some modification to other type of protocol. Because earlier we've been using TCP. On this one, we use UDP. Okay. And for user datagram, it assemble based on receipt, right? So it's just use the checksum in order to put the packet back together. Where TCP, it assembles everything and then it presents. UDP, it comes back in pieces. So each of the pieces is going to rely on the sequence number in the packet. And then once it puts together everything, then it's going to do, it's going to use a checksum to validate it. So definitely UDP is faster, right? That's why it's not, it, and it's not that reliable compared to TCP. It's slower where, you know, it still uses sequence and checksum and all of that, but it has to put everything back together before it presents it. Okay, so when you visit a website and it's unreachable, right, you get that that HTTP error is because it's not able to receive anything back and it's presented to you. It's not able to pull the file or get the, the response from the, the web server. So in for the UDP, sometimes if, if you look at media, if you're listening to music or or watching a video that, and most of the time media traffic uses UDP or even video conference like this, right? Sometimes you would get pauses and, you know, things that are not, not synchronizing appropriately is because it's UDP, it's fast, but it's not that reliable, okay? So just keep in mind that for 31, use the valid target. You can use the loop back, which is this address, that just sends it to a, your own system, okay? And then on step 32, if you use, an, you know, if you wanna put in a valid address for that, you can, okay? So you can do a send and receive. So SR method is to send and receive, okay? And on this step, what you're doing is you are, using these ports, 21, 22, and 23, okay? We, we already learned SSH is 22, right? And then so your Telnet uses 20 and 21. So basically these protocols are used to do what? For the direct communication, especially for terminal connection. And so you would have something that would say, it would show you how many packets were being sent if it's reached successfully. And it, it, it might even be able to try to send the packet, it, and then, but it's gonna give you an error if it's not able to reach that host, okay? So for this, I want you to see how you would be able to do a send and receive and using a group of ports instead of one. We saw some of this with the, with right here. So basically you incorporate a list, you declare, you, you, you define a list like D port 
and deport is a valid, make sure that this is going to be a valid name that is used for that library, right? And it's used for packet field information. Okay. Question? Yeah, for the fuzz line, I ran it and I'm just getting, uh, my screen is just full of dots. Yeah, so you're still waiting. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you get a bunch of dots, it's just, get, you have to wait a little bit. Sometimes it does time out, right? Um, if if it's not able to achieve it, but you, yeah, I I get I got that too, but it does, you know, you gotta wait a little bit. Okay, okay. thanks. Yeah. And then you can always exit, close it, and then come back to it later. Um, okay. Any questions so far with this stuff? All right, then what you can do is you can also create an asynchronous sniffer. Asynchronous sniffer is that it doesn't have to sync with that system when it's sniff. And so that's a little bit more on the passive side. Okay. So now, um, if you wanted to read more, th there is a sniffer function that's built into this library or it's the sniffer method. But on this one, you're using asynchronous sniffer, which is slightly different. Okay. So here you can sniff. And then, so before you, so in step 33, this is what I want you to remember. You're going to start it. So think of it like Wireshark when you click that shark fin button that is for scanning, right? You're going to start the scan. And then time sleep is going to be wait. And you can always change this value. And then you can have it stop. So before you stop it, when you get here, it's going to go. And then once you issue this last step, it's gonna pause it, okay? So if you just do boom, 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 it's just gonna go and then stop right away. But what you wanted to, for it to do is you, you should let it, let it run for the value that you set right here, okay? So if you want it shorter, then reduce the value. If you want it higher, then you can put in a higher value that just make it longer. Then, wait for it, and then you can issue the stop. Okay. And that was basically all I want you to kind of look at because, and if you're interested, you can, there are lots and lots of stuff on this, okay, through the documentation and different tutorial. But you can definitely use it on your Windows or your Mac OS, okay. So um, if you wanted to go into, a, you know, routing, you can also look at routes with Scapy, and then you can also use, you know, you can build your own tools. So you can refer to the documentation and you will be able to get more resources so you can practice. So what will this do for you, right? Um, you know that Python is highly demanded in, in as far as career goes, and especially for people like Cisco and Palo Alto, because the Palo Alto engineers, they, they work with this, right? So what you can do is you can start building your portfolio by creating tools, by using these tools, and then looking at existing tools. And most of them are written in Python, right? for Linux system. So, um, so you can check out <clears throat> like advanced usage. So usage gives you a lot of practice. You can look at advanced usage. And then here it goes into like SNMP, additional, you know, writing files, looking at how to be able to work with different types of protocol. and so forth, 
Okay. Now on the automata side, there's some resources for automata. So if you're interested in that, I know if you took my CIS 7, I mentioned it briefly, but here it talks about how you can look at state transitions and methods for state machines and automaton subclass. So if that would be something that you wanted to do down the line as a developer, you can look at this, okay? And it shows you how you can use this library for that, okay? Because for finite state machine, right, each state, it, each state is depending on another stage. So what, what happened is you have a state that's gonna impact another state. So here it shows you how you can define functions and work with this library for that. So there's some example you can look at. And so on. So I know that this is very brief, <laughs> but at least it gives you a taste of it and then you can explore further. I was writing something with Ansible and then I thought about it. Um, just, you know, maybe I'll come back to Ansible down the line and then work, put in some stuff, but it's just the challenge with Ansible is that it's, tied to Linux control systems and then incorporating Ansible sometimes can be difficult. So, but you can definitely automate the task through Ansible also using this library as well. Any questions? Um, yeah, you mentioned in the beginning that you can only use PyX with uh, Python 2.7? 7. 7, yeah. So when you have a system like the Raspberry Pi that can run Python well, 2 and Py, yeah, can you yeah. do Py? Would mm -hmm. you be able to do PyX on the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, so when you do the, the sudo app get install, make sure that you point it to the Py Python 2 and you use Python 2, 2 with PyX. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in terminal, you can use either Python 3 or Python 2. So when you when you issue Python 2, you're able to. to so um, a lot of these use pip and, and they also use Python install directly. So you can do Python 2, you know, install and then the package. But um, let me go back. I think I saw that with PyX. Let me look. And then I was just curious with the, um network automation device. I think it was from lab three. Mm -hmm. I remember it was Python two. Yes. And I was wondering if that was part of the reason why I couldn't run Telnet because all the py, py .pi modules mm -hmm. were in Python three. Yeah. And I couldn't and pip install. Yeah, so, so yeah, you can't do, well, pip should work with two as well. Cause. Oh, but I would have to say, PIP or two. Yeah, first. so yeah, you have to say PIP two or PIP three because when you do PIP three, that refers to Python three. But if you issue regular PIP, it should be able to pull it um, for two as default. But also, you know, what we set as default for the Python version or what Python version is installed on that machine is, you know, so yeah, going back to really troubleshoot that is maybe look at what Python version is installed and then use that version to pull it. Um, so here, yeah, other questions? Yeah, actually I'm stuck in step 18. I'm getting a depreciated in favor error or depreciation warning. When you get the IP? Like yeah, when I put IP underscore parentheses underscore and it's mm -hmm. it's giving me uh yeah and the type error int is not so scriptable or something like that. Yeah, so so um I read a little bit on this 
uh, yesterday when I used it. So I, when I ran it, I didn't have any problem with that. But if you have depreciated, that means that it's not supporting that with, are, what are you running? And uh, are you running on Windows, no, Mac I'm OS? It, I'm running it on the, the Ubuntu. The Ubuntu Linux? Yeah. Okay, one second. Let me get to mine real quick and then maybe I can have you share a screen one second. Yeah, when I tested it yesterday, it was. Is anyone that's following along, have you guys gotten the same error or is it just me? I think you might have. Uh, so I'll show you what mine. So that's what mine looks like. Okay. Yeah. So um, let me see what your error says. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Now you can share screen. Share screen. Make it bigger. Okay, that's why I can see. All right. So even okay, so you got to where it shows the destination. You got the time to live. Default is sixty four. Um, okay, so your imp module is depreciated. It says in favor of imp, um, import live. See the module documentation alternative views import fn match glob trace back at exit local and stat python3 code.py run code yeah so it's not able to do it's not able to get the stuff from from Yeah, so if you pass a regular method for IP, it shows it for IP underscore. Okay, one second, okay? Because I think I know what the problem is. Um, I'm just looking at some reference for import lib. Yeah, it's not abstract. Let me see. I need to go back to what they were talking about depreciation. I think in the documentation, it also talked about that. Uh, IP, IP tool. Skip you got packet. Mm 
Anybody else have the same issue with Chris or no? I think Kevin, again, me said that he's, he had the same issue as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. I thought I read it somewhere yesterday about that and it says it might be depreciated. Um, but let me see if there's a fix for it, okay. That's not what I want. It says each packet can be built and dissected in Python underscore is the latest result. Um, yeah, for some reason it's not understanding your your IP underscore. Let me see your error again. This is depreciation warning. The imp module is deprecated in favor of import lib. So imp module. And did you do the installation with the interface when you unzip and, and just install or you just in, install regularly? I installed it. Like I just followed your instructions. Oh, the, the instructions? Yes, that's all. I, I, the only one that I skipped was eight because I just left the color scheme the same. Yeah. But other than that, I sent every single one the same. I, I used, I, I followed every instruction. Let me see. Let's see why, what ties to the imp. Um, try import, import lib. Just like that. Mm -hmm. Just press enter. Yeah. No, you got to do import and then import lib one word. Import. Import lib. Yeah. Okay, now try uh, to press the arrow key a couple of times. You can do it. Oh, there you go. 
Yeah, it's still throwing the air. Is it saying the same thing? Let's see no, th this time it's a different error. Uh, That's the error I have. Yeah, so self dissect file local lib US. Like object required, not IP. Okay. So now it doesn't give you that imp message anymore. But um, It says distribution package scapey. Okay, so I think what happened is when you use IP and then underscore, which is the most up to date of the IP, it's uh -huh. not able to plug, it's not able to plug that in, right? For the parameter, because basically you're just saying that put this in, just autofill this into the parameter. And I think it's looking for uh, based on the message it's saying, it's trying to get field and it's not able to find it. Okay, so let me see why it's doing that. Because it's really, uh, uh, let me see. Maybe you have to do the import util. I think that's what I did before. One second. Let me find a proper thing for it. Because I was troubleshooting something else. Um, okay, here. Try this. I'm going to copy this. This ties to finding IP address or um, what they call it um, setup thing. So try this. Or right, first exit out of Scapey. Do it as a method. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can be in that directory. So try to see if you can do pip install Python 3 util. Pip install Python 3 util. Mm -hmm. With the S. You're missing, Where is it? You're missing the S. Utils with the Utils. S. Okay, so it puts the utils there. And then now um, go back to Scapey. Oh, wait, wait. Before you do that, Chris, uh, type in IP space address for me. IP space address? Uh huh. Okay, so it's able to pull your eye in it. Okay, now go to Scapey. So pseudo Scapey. Login. Okay, now uh, you can do IP underscore and let's see if it's doing anything. Okay, so less error now. <laughs> All yeah. right, so we're getting closer. So let's, let's try to debug it. Um, I think the okay. underscore now is the problem. Yeah, so I think it's not able, it's just diffusion warning. So yeah, it's still oh, having issue with the import. Do I have to put, do, do you think if I import add name? it? Yeah, it's not able to get it from, Why does it say code.py? Are you running? Oh, um, hold on. Let me let me find out why if yours is showing code.py, okay?
it's not able to pull it from that file. That's what it's saying. CD, Skippy. LS. Yeah, why is that a code.py on yours? User lib. Yeah, see if you can find that file. It says line 96 in run code execution self local. I think it's not able to to call that method right here. Yeah, and it's not able to call that method. That's what it's saying. Can I see your error again real quick? Self.local line one in module. Name is not defined. There's a name error. If you issue regular IP method without the field, does it pull it up? Type in IP. Yeah. It's blank. It's only showing IP. Um, so you did, this is step 18, all right? Yes. Okay. Can you type in A for me? Oh, uh, maybe you have to restart the whole process again. Uh, just type in a did it declare you yeah. declare it earlier right oh yeah, yeah but do you think i have to do all the process again yeah because we exit out escapey it didn't store it yeah let's see oh you only have you can only start at sub 10 so a oh, so 10. A is IPTTL 10. Just have to declare uh, it and then call A. Type A. Okay. So it shows that now. Okay. And then A dot SRC. Okay. That's your loop back. All right. A dot DST is and then the destination address. And then um, A dot SRC again. Okay, now it gives you the regular address. Okay, mm -hmm. now you're going to do a delete. So DEL. And then in the parameter a.ttl. Okay, now do a again. Okay, so it gives you their destination address. Okay. Um, now try IP underscore. Yep. That's what I expected. Okay, so it's just not able to show you the, yeah, it's not able to fill in that. That's okay, because what all that does is, Chris, yeah, that oh, it gives you the packet, the version information and the source and the destination address. Let's try, According, um, I just looked at chat and it says um somebody um, last name with Umali it says they restarted the whole thing and yeah it worked it, yeah so yeah it's just not able to pull that file that file is there so yeah you might want to reboot your machine up fire it up again and then it might be able to to because for some reason after the installation it's not able to pull the file for some reason but okay. you can try that but or what you can do is you know, replace the destination address and have it use a loopback. So it, it's sending to itself, you know what I mean? 
yeah. and and see if that works uh, because sometimes when it doesn't reach a destination it's not able to plug that in so okay okay all righty yeah michelle oh. probably uh-huh all right, should, should I just okay. do it or should I share or should I just do it on my own? Whatever you want to do. Okay. Let's restart. Any other questions? So um, what I was telling Chris is that for sometimes in the case where if you when you run the installation, sometimes it throws error where it can't unpack the .py file. It's possibly because it's not able to um, have all the proper utilities. So in the chat earlier, I put in how you can install utils. And with utils, that is basically replacing the imp. But in most cases, you should still be able to do that. But in the case you need to troubleshoot it, you can also install other packages for the utility. Um, and then, yeah, uh, yeah, because so what Michelle put was that for her output, the version number, the length. So that means that it didn't send it through properly. Maybe try your destination address as your loopback address. Okay, and it's giving you that. Let me look at mine real quick one second. Yeah, okay. your flag and your flag, um, it should show the link. Does it say your TTL is also zero? That's really strange. Oh, okay, so it didn't register your source or your de destination. And you you rewrote everything, right? You declare A and you go through B and all of that. Crap. Let me see if Chris is getting the same thing and if that's the uh, case. Okay. Yeah, because online I got I got that it sent it. Okay. So it works. Man, I can't see it's too small. You don't have to use a zoom, go yeah. to your virtual machine and then you can change your preference on your on your um Okay. Yeah, so if you did eight through, yeah, it you should be fine with nine through 18 and it should, it should show that. Okay. Okay. <sighs> okay. Well, I have to figure out why yours is doing that. I think it's just missing something or it's not unpacking correctly somehow. I have a question. Sure, Michelle. I, I noticed that there, there's a net translation going on. Mm-hmm. Is that what I saw? Yeah. So I, I think the virtual machine settings, 
You can also check on your virtual box. It should be a net. It should be on net. So on virtual box, you can go to setting and then click network and it should say attached to net. On mine, it says net and it's not bridge. So Chris, you click on your um, your V box on um, the bottom of your go to your taskbar on the bottom. Right here. No, no. Oh. Uh, outside. Go go to the virtual box, the cube on the bottom. Uh huh. And then go to settings. Yeah, so go to network on the left. Yeah, it's default. So you should have it on net. We're not port forwarding or anything. Michelle, did you have a question about that? I just didn't know if that was maybe a reason why. Yeah, I think I installed an additional package that resolved the issues. So I think you should be okay. Um, so the only step that didn't work for you is gonna be- 18. 18, but you do have a source and a destination address because you did that all along. When you did the a.source, that's your mm -hmm. source address. When you did the DST, it just couldn't use the method from the library, which is IP underscore. And I have to see why it's doing that on yours and not on mine. Okay. Yeah, because on so mine, it, it did show it. It shows, it shows because I use both loopback address and it shows my source and my destination as loopback. Mm -hmm. um, if you so, unshare, unshare, I show you what mine looks like. Should I, if, if, if I can't get it fixed before, should I just put there? Just move on. Yeah, move on? just okay. take the screen, just, you know, or you can just answer the question. You already know the source and the destination address. Oh, okay. You can make a note of it. So mine looks like this when I use the IP, but I installed a bunch of tools when I tested this lab. So it could be that something that, that I did. I think I had issues with the setup.py. It, it keeps throwing me error. So Mm -hmm. I did install the I the um the util and I did install a couple other things including map and I wanted to write a step for you guys to graph out the the and for the analysis so I did install the map plot lib uh, with it so that was some of the things that I installed but um and then I I was having issue with running the setup before so you know but it works now i troubleshoot it but it should look like this it tells you like this is ip version 4 um so i'll find a fix for it and then i'll let you guys know i'll put it into the lab itself if i find the fix for it okay because I have okay. to find out why it's giving you the, you guys those errors and it's not tracking the IP. It should, um, but maybe it's just missing some uh, a library or something that needs to be incorporated with that. But you can definitely do the other steps. It's not depending on the last one, okay? So like 19, you can definitely do 19 and do the hex dump but you did install the TCP dump, right? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, so do the hex dump and then, uh, so you can still move on without it, okay? Okay. Yeah, that's just one thing that you, that we couldn't display and that's all. So I'll find a fix for it, you know? So even if I test the lab sometime, it works perfectly for me and then, when my students do it, sometimes it has problem, but that's okay. We'll, we'll find the solution for it. Okay, I'll stop share now. Any other questions? Okay, so Michelle, I'll take notes of your output and I'll see why it's not. It's, it's giving you zero. 
Um, all that is is just it's not assembling that packet and it's not sending it. Um, so, okay. And so it doesn't have any. I'm sorry. It it doesn't have anything to do with like turning off the Wi-Fi or any settings on my that I converted this laptop from a Windows to a Linux laptop. It does. It's nothing like that. Oh, so you turn off your connection. Um, it might be tied to your interface. So if you turn off your network interface in any way, it might. It's not able to send it. So all of these networking tools, it's tied to your in interface. And on the virtual machine, it sees it as an e ether interface. So you can look at the INET information and it'll tell you which interface it's using. So oh, if you okay. have the, yeah, if you have that disabled, that might be why it's giving you all zero. It's trying to send it, just not able to send it. Okay. <laughs> so if you guys get stuck on 18, <coughs> you can move on to the other steps. Just make a note of it. Other I'll questions? link, I already typed it in. I'll just link the answers for the people so I can just copy and paste. Yep, there you go. <coughs> was that from yours or it, it, you can try it on no, your, your, your window system and see what it does, right? It's, it's from yours. <laughs> oh, okay, but for the window system, if, if you try it on the window system through command prompt, because it, it should do the same thing on both sides. So possibly the, on the Linux side, it, something didn't unpack properly. And <coughs> so, yes, thank you for putting that in. But um, you guys can check out the Windows side and see what it does. I haven't gotten that far with the Windows because I was just mainly testing it on the Linux side. But I'll see what it does, OK? Any other questions? Let's see, I got mostly everybody here. Patrick dropped off. I don't know where he went. Okay, all right. Add your name into the chat. Um, I'll stick around for questions if you have questions. But I hope you don't run into any issues with the lab outside of 18. But if you do, let me know. I, oh, yep. I had a question from last for Monday. Okay. Remember when we were doing the um, the script to search through a log? Uh -huh. It had a log extension. Does Can it have any extension, like a text extension? Text. You can probably do it as a text extension, but <laughs> if you use a, a certain library, because all you're doing on that one is you use the red, uh, the, the, the regular expression library. So regular expression can search through a text file but if you're using like additional method outside of that library um usually that might require but from what i recall hold on one second let me look at my notes i'm just gonna look at which library we use okay so just, the, just the regular expression module yeah so it should it should be fine with your your dot text txt um, as long as you know you point to that file so regular expression should be able to search it so um, probably not a doc or um, anything else but a log or a text file for that well because doc is microsoft oriented and um and the app it requires the applications to open DOC because some files are application oriented and some are not, right? And text file is pretty universal. So I'm thinking like, you know, when you when you do regular expression, you have to see how that application would treat the function that's specified in the library for regular expression. I mean, it works with all C-based language, so it might be okay. But I haven't about, tried it with doc. Okay, how about a CSV file? 
CSV might because CX, CSV you can convert it to text or other format. Um, so you might be able to do that with CSV. I'm not 100% okay, sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But from my experience, it's mostly with log dot log file because all 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 systems usually you know for appliances they generate dot log file. Um, so syslog type of application, that's what it's usually looking for. And I'm assuming that text would generally be okay because you know you can convert text file to other format, but other files like doc and you know a, other type of file, you cannot convert it to text um, without its application. You know, so like if you open up a document, you have to use an application in order to do that to convert it to any other file. So um, there might be some API requirement across. That's what I'm thinking, restriction that is, okay? So I will give you more of a definite answer. I gotta look at it further and play with it a little bit more to kind of tell you whether it's gonna, I never use it with docs, so. Other questions, you guys? Okay. Have a wonderful afternoon. If you don't have any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit in case you have questions or need help. Thank you. You're oh, welcome. Dr. Yeah. Wood, are, are we meeting tomorrow for the yes. IRA? Okay. Yeah, so we'll do tomorrow and the following week. And then I have a meeting with them after that um, in on the second. But yes, we'll meet tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Okay. Bye. Uh, Dr. Um, yes. This weekend, since I got my new PC, I'm going to go back to uh, the GSN3 lab and start working on that. Is it okay if I email you if I run any problems? Yeah, let me know. Um, Michelle, she, she, she talked to me about it. She's gotten pretty far. She got all the way to where she runs the automated, you know, the automation machine. And um, yeah, you heard her earlier. So I think that particular automation machine and the library that it uses, it, it uses 2.7 instead of three. And so if you try to write it and there's some difference, it's very close. So it might not be able to understand it, uh, but yeah. So if you can get it working, then good for you. But so far, like, I, you know, I'm stuck there too. Not <laughs> uh, no, when I try to run GSN3 with my virtual machine on my computer, I okay. blue screened. Yeah. So it's just and that you. So I don't want to do it again because I don't want something to happen to my PC. Yeah. But if you wanted to just check, check out GSN3 um, and then, you know, do that. Yeah. If you have any questions, let me know. No, no, I just want to go back and do it because I didn't feel like I actually did the lab correctly. I got it. I just, we just ended up writing a script and I didn't even get to see if it worked or not. And I was really right. disappointed in that. Right. This I just wanted to ask is if I could bother you or not. So that's okay. Um, so the only downside is that with the appliance that you have is the, the hard part is the image that you are using, getting that image to work. And then, um, so once you have that working, then you can, you can go into the automation machine and use its console, right? Which is the terminal to, to see if you can execute it. So first you got to write the file into that automation machine and save it under the URS bin Python, right? Um, so make sure that it's in the right directory where the Python stuff goes. That's okay. my advice for you. Second is once you save that file as a .py, then you can, you can execute it. So all you have to do is just type in the file name in the terminal, right? Mm -hmm. With the path and everything see if it runs. And if it's giving you an error, that means that it's not able, but with the file, make sure that you have all the import, which you do, all the stuff that's properly. But remember, anytime that you import things, those things have to be installed on that machine to be running. So if you do import NC client, make sure that you do sudo app get install NC client, okay? Because if you're trying to import something that's not installed, it's gonna it's gonna go crazy. But so when you get the automation machine working in your VM for the GSN, 
um, go into it, install the library that you need first, then write your PY, your script, and save it into where the, the, the bin for the folder for the, the Python stuff. And if you wanted to know the path, you just do a list and it's going to show you because automatically, if you don't, it's going to put it under home. And you don't want it under home. You want it with the Python so it runs it as a Python application. Okay. Okay. And then after you save it, then you when you run it, you just simply execute it in the terminal with the path. Like so if if you save it as you USR slash bin slash Python three, then you type that path in, in front of the file name and then the file name with its extension like test.py. Okay and see if it executes. If it executes, then good for you. But I had told Michelle to use, um, the instead of the NX, use another router or a switch with the OS. And with the OS, it's slightly different um, than the way that you would script it. So when you script it, look at the interface for the OSI for you know that. But if you're able to load the NX9000, then you script, you can use the same script that you've previously written. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. While you were talking, I'm nodding my head, and I was like, realize she can't see me nod my head. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it, you know, so just logically think through the process. If you save it somewhere, you gotta go find it at that place. If you're trying to import something, make sure that you install it. Okay. Yes. And then your script has to match the interface of how that appliance would be, and it should work. Right. The challenge I had was that when I tried to load the image, it just required way too much resources on my virtual machine, which originally doesn't have that much RAM to start with. So um, so when you load the image, also keep in mind that, you know, I had written down that you need to up it to 8000. Just keep it at four, because if you do, it's going it, to um, because if your virtual machine has eight gigs, to start, right? Like let's say mm -hmm. you size it for eight gig and the virtual machine inside it use the eight gig. It leaves nothing for the outside virtual machine to be the GSN virtual machine to function. Because when you load the image itself is a virtual machine inside another virtual machine, you see? Yeah. So, so think about that. Like I, I know I wrote down it to up it to 8,000 but you don't have to up it, right? Just keep it at two. It's gonna be a little slow but um, but then also think about that that some of the library like the you know the px the pyx and some of the library actually uses python 2.7 instead of 3 so the command is a little different um, across with the script okay got it yeah. all right let Hi. me know <laughs> all right you have a great day dr Wincy. Uh, you one too. day okay take care bye